<laughs> Welcome everyone to Iterative User Experience Design. Uh, this is a case study of a website called Find at Cambridge. Um, Started six years ago. <laughs> yeah, and we're a we're a six person um, tech cooperative. We use free and open source software to build what we call like the digital commons, which is you know tools that are out there for the public benefit, community benefit, public good. Um, and Finding Cambridge is a great example of it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But first of all, I've been introduced myself. Um, my name is Ben Ellis, I'm one of the, the co-founders of Agar, um back in 2006, and I lived in the Boston area, and that's where I made the connection, so yeah, came to this site, and I am now in Minneapolis, because Boston just been cold enough. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, so we're really excited about this concept and this way of working. Um, basically, uh, you know, as the DrupalCon marketing team says, be human, right? <laughs> and let's interpret this in the most clinical way we can. No, um, you know, being human is a huge part of the Drupal community. It's a huge part of like why we do what we do. Um, and yeah, and making the sites yeah. that you need to. A huge part of being human is to talk to the humans out there. Uh, so if you don't know how to get started with that, there's a great <laughs> WikiHow article on how to talk to people. Um, I, uh, I refer my 13-year-old son to WikiHow all the time when he asks questions about life. It's just a running joke of like, if you ever need help with anything, just go to WikiHow. Um, they have advice on everything, but no. Um, we will be uploading this entire talk from the keyhouse, and offer full of lists and images. Yeah, but, um, but honestly, um, talking, to, <laughs> talking to humans, talking to the people that we build uh, tools for is the most rewarding part of, of the job, for me at least. Um, and it's a, a big, like, Really, because that's the the center of it all, the grounding of it. Um, when we talk about research, it's it isn't super clinical. I mean, it is in terms of like we want to get accurate information. But um, for example, I led like a user path journey mapping exercise with a legal team, and we had people who had benefited from their legal help come into the room and share their stories, and they were really powerful stories. We were talking about when they were facing eviction and feeling hopeless and like how they moved through that with that team together. And um, you know, a lot of the stories started out following the flow that I had outlined um, for the workshop, but you know, quickly meandered and dovetailed and spun, you know, through people's experiences, right? And like really hearing firsthand the challenges that they were going through and how we were solving helping on some small, you know, but meaningful level, address those issues. Um, all of that circuitous talking, just hearing people talk in their stories, informed so much about that project. Um, and uh, similar things can be said about Find It, and so we will show some, share some of those anecdotes with you uh, in this presentation. So, uh, what is Find It Cambridge? Um, it's a web-centered approach to helping residents find all that their communities have to offer. Um, and so uh, this is the, the new design that we're implementing currently in Drupal 8. Um, and we've kind of framed everything around opportunities. And as the name implies, find it. The central component of the site is search. Um, and so uh, opportunities are first conceived of at the organizational level. Every opportunity 
um, flows from an organization that's providing this. Um, it could be the Cambridge uh, Public Library System, it could be a youth soccer program, it could be uh, a department within the city government. Um, so uh, one really great um, effect of this project has been it's actually helped facilitate the breaking down of silos between departments and between nonprofits as various service providers. They now see each other. They now um, recognize where there's gaps in um, services, where there's redundancy in services. Uh, so organizations think can then create programs. So programs are kind of like ongoing, um, uh, it could be classes, um, basically uh, something that's a little more continuous than a specific event would be. Although there's some fuzziness between those and it's something that we... Programs and, mm -hmm. uh, and after school programs and that runs for the whole school year. Yeah, and there's um, there's some help in, in conceiving of things in this way, certainly like for us uh, from a development perspective, but a big piece of what we've learned is that to you know a visitor, whether that summer camp is called an event or a program is not really important to them. It's important that they find it based on the content of it. Um, so then we have events. Uh, and we also have places, but... Um, that's kind of the new site. Yeah, that's the new site. We talked about why it was decided to be split out of programs. Um, and, 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 yeah. um, so the inspiration for, for the site um, was that you know, people in the city of government, Nancy Power is um, head of the, the Youth Council, and um, Leo Berg is just a friend of hers who is the one who he was. Um, but it was, he really had the idea and he was inspired by a program that was running in Wisconsin. But the general concept is that in any large municipality, any large city, there are myriad programs and events available to people, but they're coming from the school department, they're coming from the parks department, they're coming from the libraries, they're coming from hundreds of nonprofit organizations. And if you are a caregiver or a parent with a child and you're trying to find something for your child, uh, it's very hard to have to go to like 200 places to actually see it all. Um, and so to bring that together in one spot and really help service um, like groups in the city that were are trying to um, make these opportunities like visible and available, um, I, you know, had that idea, and so Leah Berg took the vision um, from a, a funded project in Wisconsin, um, What's Up was its name, and unfortunately that has wound down, um, I think I'm already by the time they started working on this, um, but uh, yeah, so um, one of the things we benefited from was, was their vision, their willingness to talk to the stakeholders that really matter, the parents using it, and then the other thing is that the youth board and board Youth Council rather, um, works with service providers all the time. So I have really deep knowledge of what their needs were and what, uh, you know, what would be too big a burden for them to, to update and what um, they want to show. So. Uh, so, yeah, so they, you know, yeah, the, the general knowledge, like they had, they, you know, they, they knew this was a problem, but they went out and did user research before we ever um, got involved. And so um, they found that families, particularly working class, and um, especially immigrants, not necessarily speaking language, were very disconnected from city programs, that there are opportunities that people took advantage of that they didn't even know about, didn't even know how to start taking advantage of. Um, and yeah, the events weren't in any of the, there's no real like, local news, um, and nothing carrying the events. Um, the city website is difficult to use and you know, wasn't listing most of the stuff anyway. Um, people are intimidated to ask for help. And then, you know, when people do look at programs, sometimes the first one they find are too expensive or too far away from them, or don't child care. And then, uh, you know, teachers and service providers 
themselves who may be providing one program don't know about others. Um, they be, they're, you know, so even people who've reached out to a social worker or a teacher or someone who is totally in a position to help them and wants to help them, that person didn't have the knowledge um, to help. So even when someone gets connected enough to government, then in theory they would now be connected to the opportunities, like internally, um, you know, people trying to help in Cambridge didn't have all of that knowledge available. Yeah. And so the help for Code for Boston, um, they did a ton of preliminary research. Um, they also had, I think, it's like interns from the universities in Cambridge out too. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and one quick thing about the Code for Boston uh, work is I found this to be a really helpful way for the civic tech groups to contribute meaningfully to open source projects or just projects in general. Um, it can be really hard in a, like a hackathon format to really provide a tool that's going to meet someone's needs and last. Like we all know how much work actually goes into building something that's going to be used and done right, and then maintained afterwards. But yeah, <laughs> unmaintained but, websites have to hack a box. It's like I don't know. Yeah, and so something that I've been kind of talking to civic groups and encouraging them to do is do user research for projects that are coming up. Like yeah, that's you know one of the first questions I think we all think is like how can we do this with the budget constraints? You know, one is that was a really great um, alliance there. Uh, they got to know the community better. They got to, I mean, even, I think even um, kind of incidental knowledge of you know, learning what people's experiences are and what they need could inform other projects that they would be interested in proposing to the city. So. And so they did tons of research of different kinds. And this is something where it's like, we're lucky. Like we had a client that had the resources, the connections to do this, but you know, there are, um, you know, there's, there's freecodecamp.org that does, um, that things, you know, it's like a, a boot camp, coded boot camp, but connects people with nonprofits. There's a lot of things like that, and this plate says that we can turn to like, more productive um, uses. Um, yeah. Anyhow, um, but yeah, we get to share the insights that um, our client figured out. <laughs> so they did comparative analysis of other city online resource directors, and this is something anyone can do pretty quickly, always look at what's there. Um, built out detailed personas, and then our, we'll talk about our designer, built on those even further, um, of, of, of city demographic information interviews, and this is for the, the caregivers who are looking for information, and then interviews with 220 service providers, which are the people who are offering programs and events for you. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, and then also in addition to the interviews, did survey responses from uh, 50 caregivers. Yeah, which, um which they admitted ended up, you really did hit that law of diminishing returns as far as like the information you get from the surveys. But it kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is like user research is also just an opportunity to build a community. And it's so like talking to 220 service providers helped build um, ownership and like investment in find it. So there's also that relationship building with parts when you're doing this work too. So it's not purely for the, the, the data. The key to the success of the project, I've been talking to people in Minneapolis about doing the same kind of site because they're all doing a little bit. And what they said was that, yeah, they got it started. And then the information, you know, then, you know, the service providers didn't keep providing updated information. They got out of date. No one visited. And then the search bars are like, well, they're really not. No one's even visiting. And so it's just like, shoo, gets by. Yeah. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. We find in Cambridge. And you know, the iterations we've gone to to make sure things work is, is a lot of fun. That. So the needs identified, like, you know, they sort of knew, they did super research, and that the needs are an easily searchable website with all resources in place, a program manager to coordinate with service providers to maintain comprehensive information on opportunities. Like, so, a full-time staff person, the website is not going to be enough. They knew that from the start, also key. Um, and that a phone number to call and talk to an understanding person, which in this case is the same program manager, which he would love to not be one person doing both the relationship with the service providers and the responding to the community, but yeah. 
one person can do. <laughs> it's like one and a half full time staff that's that's handling all of that. So, um, but yeah, um, like a website's not not one of the fun. Yeah. So the yeah. So here are the personas that uh, we came up with from that uh, research and talking to caregivers. Uh, so we have the caring but isolated parent, the low info access parent, the high info access parent, youth service program provider, the outreach worker, and the family Cambridge, the website manager, basically. And um, uh, I think one thing here too that's important is it's really it's really easy for us to meet the needs of the high info access parent. In fact, they're already getting their needs met a lot of times. I'm a parent, and uh, I would consider myself in that, but I'm not even that high info of a parent, and I like summer programs oftentimes book up, you know, mm -hmm. day of, two days in, because I'm just not as in the loop as like <laughs> a lot of other parents are about these things. And then you imagine, people with even more barriers, like they're even more out of the loop. So it's really, I mean, this is a common problem of like, you're building an online tool and the people who are most comfortable and have the, the best access to the internet are benefiting from it the most. And so I'm, uh, I wouldn't say we're perfect in like, in this, but we really do try and center um, the low info access caregiver and the, um, the isolated parent. Um, as much as possible because those are, you know, that's, that's really like the crux of the problem is, is getting um, those folks connected to the community and, and the services yeah. that exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, um, yeah, so, you know, outside of the website trying to fix that problem of like, just like, oh, we're making these opportunities available to everyone and the people who least need it get it because they have the most connections um, and the most knowledge, um, they're, they're, they're looking at, they're like, you know, making sure that not everything can be put in advance, like actually mm -hmm. intentionally leaving open last minute spaces um, and, and other things to try to you know, really have a full conception of equity in, uh, in, in what's going on. So it's very cool to work with people um, doing that. Um, so the the you know big thing to remember is that you know we are here for for like any website is is here for an audience and who is this for? This is for parents looking for activities um, for their children and um, for the program managers. So, so first, it's for the caregivers, um, and second, it's for the program administrator with service providers who are going to be logging in. Given information, and the third, but still very important audience group, not forget the actual like program, um, the site manager themselves. Um, we report. In a comparative analysis um, of the of the other sites, the key things identified. Sorry, on to the next slide. Yeah. Um, Key things identified were um, that people, that the overall look and feel were in, in important. So they, they not just like compare to the sites, they talked to the people who built them and saw some of the user research they did, and they even showed the sites to people in Cambridge to see what their reaction was. So having it be um, friendly looking, not too much text, um, was a good thing. And what they were learning was that the other websites out there were having too much text. And, not many pictures, and that the other sites weren't mobile friendly, um, functionality provided, um, there was a calendar in the grid style, which wasn't very clear what was going on, it was all just little dots on the grid, um, and there was no way for people to log in and create a personal profile and um, save their favorite links and their information and stuff. And it's fine if the site still doesn't have that, because that's always been falling below on priority. Um, and there was yeah, no sense of community among the users. And another one that um, is also those same things were identified out in the Minneapolis area, Twin Cities area. And yeah, would love to build that. It's not how they don't get that, but to like, build a site that really connects people person to person. It's still very much like connecting them to the, the services. Um, but, uh, okay, so first thing to learn is iterate on what other people have built. Um, so they look carefully at Summerville Hub. Um, 
and you know, learning about problems with automatic translation, which we also still haven't solved, but it's good to know about it. Um, but yeah, and they you know took some design concepts from there, as you can see. Um, they started out with. Um, Um, you know, similar idea, but it's slightly expanded on the grid of ages and all of that stuff. Um, so I guess just to make the point that, like, you know, when we talk about iterative um, user experience design, user, iterative improvements to user experience, you know, we're not talking like you need the continuous integration workflow where it's like every four hours, like you've seen like. They're not clicking that as much, like rolling out the next update and like all split testing and all of that stuff. No, it's like just improvement. The point is that you iterate on it, you keep doing it. It can be discontinuous, there can be lags, there can be stops, but you keep coming back. Yeah, especially if you if you have things that are volunteer powered, you know, for, for, for Boston has to find the time to meet with people. Uh, yeah, it's hard to hard to people with busy schedules to talk to them to get feedback. But. So we're just saying like sort of top level lessons of doing um, iterative user experience design, um, go where your users are. And in this case, it was great. User testing with people in the computer lab of a library was where they were. Unfortunately, this is what was in the library. Uh, and so, you know, first thing you know, is we had to support that. Um, but listening to people is the real essence of the UX process. And, and the, the computer lab, after like the initial version of the site was sort of soft launched, was really fantastic. Like, there's nothing, and we're going to show all these other tools for looking at how users experience it, but there's nothing quite like being in the room and seeing the person like like trying to click on something that doesn't work, or <laughs> or or seeing what Internet Explorer is doing to their site. Oh my god, our site. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and knowing yeah. that this really does have to be fixed. Yeah, and the usability testing that we did after this first iteration of the site most of that was done in the library, which was also really great, like just to have that entire kind of, uh, authentic environment in which you were finding something. You know. Number one thing you're trying to do is meet expectations. Uh, that's like, and you know, it's what, what you're trying to do as an agency with clients, but it's what you're trying to do with, um, with your website, with the people who are coming to it for any reason at all, like meet their expectations, don't let them down. Um, so one example of, that was power users, the, the service providers, and like sort of the, the people going through uh, like helping other people, like the ones who knew half the services in the city already, but wanted this resource to be able to make sure they found it. Um, reported not finding organizations with terms they expected, um, because they would search for words that would actually be in the description of the program, but. You know, for these power users, they actually were interested in which organization was providing it because they wanted to talk to the organization about something. They'd search, they'd filter, they'd go to the organization filter, they'd search for terms that they knew this organization was involved in, and it wouldn't come up. And they're just like, what the heck? And so, one example of what we did to iterate on this to improve things is we just said, like, okay, if the term is on a program or event, like, we will have it come up, we will we'll include all of that like in the rendering of the, of the search items. I'm not saying it well, but like, if you search for a term that was only on a program while you were filtered to organizations, you'd still get the result of that organization. Um, that's just meeting expectations. Most of these regular improvements fall into this category of closing the gap between a person's expectations using the site and what the site was doing. And I was around for the first portion of design, so I'll let them talk about that with uh, Todd. Uh, yeah, so this is your opportunity to iterate before you build. Um, and uh, I presented this with our design club, like, I think it's fantastic. And um, yeah, I guess the, the big thing is that you know, in working with him is that he knows that HTML and CSS are what the site is all going to have to do. He has an understanding of Drupal, and he did all of that. But, um, uh, there were 297 messages um, that he was included on um, that he happened to be CC'd on, that I happened to be CC'd on. So there's other communication he had with the city um, that I wasn't in on um, just in 2015, and the project didn't even start until May of 2015. Uh, 
And so he consumed this huge amount of user research that the, uh, that the city had managed to get done and created the content models and relationships between them and sort of modeled that in you know, a pretty programming way um, so he can generate uh, a wireframe from structured data. And this is the wireframe that then started to show the people. And then on the other side, collecting additional data, um, we built our, you know, we had the client, like, and, and Todd had the client set up like ways for the service providers to start getting stuff in. So we haven't touched Drupal at all. Um, so we just set it up first in the Google Doc. And what we learned there in collecting, so this is for service providers to enter information about the programs and events they offer. Um, setting it up this way with just fields in a spreadsheet, it gave too much freedom. Like it, Todd got like two just the, you know distant weird results to actually make into structured data, and so. Um, you could have made a Google form, um, just made a you know, quick Drupal web hit, you know, Drupal content type. Um, uh, but what we started doing is using Contentful um, and any other sort of content, you know, gather content's another one um, that can gather content in a more structured way. And Todd wired that content up to um, to a static site generator to produce wireframes. As Todd says, a wireframe allows us to experience and learn from the design while it's still in the process. And this is one example of the AI yeah, the information architecture document um, produced. So already starting to look like the site uh, still does. And you know, after you know, so that those things were taken and shown to real caregivers. The service providers got to you know see if they were able to get all the information they felt was necessary to be in there. We got to, you know, Todd be able to process the results and turn it into um, wireframes that we then, um, like really nice wireframes that people actually used. And so there was one iteration of it where we just printed out, like the website was you know, designed, was printed out on a huge piece of paper, and a lot of people in the room, you know, like came and looked at it, and then like one more round and actually, you know, had people use it on a, on a, you know, it was HTML and CSS, they could click around, like, they didn't do anything, but they could click and people could watch and you could see what it was. And so all that iteration was done and then it was handed off to us to build. Um, and so, yeah, one of the first pieces of iteration that wasn't caught in that first round was that, um, it was listed at, <coughs> as grades mostly, like preschool, junior kindergarten, grade five, which itself was uh, quite a range, um, <laughs> and then grade six to eight. And so, you know, the, both the ranges and how it was presented went through an iteration pretty early on. So that was swapped to at ages, because it turns out that parents did indeed think of their children more. Uh, by age than by what well, grade they were in. So that was one of the many little things that like, we just, you know, the client and the designer and all of us, even as we tried to stay in touch with the caregivers, we sort of just kept falling into doing things the way that service providers thought. And so a lot of this has been like taking the language that makes sense to the service provider, which is, well, you know, we're an after school program, we provide for grade five. Um, to put it in language that made sense more for parents. Um, and, but even as I'm saying that we're getting too much into what the service providers thought, um, we still want to really take care of them. And so instead of a user profile, the user profile page and you log into Drupal, which would be nothing for a service provider, uh, we made the default destination uh, a dashboard where they can um, add their, you know, add another organization or add programs and events. And we really have iterated on this in, in the latest version. I think we'll get a slide of that too later on. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, for the service providers, they would have this feeling of, I've made a huge mistake. When you throw something away and delete something and think immediately, uh, you need to get that thing back. And so you want to dive into the garbage chute or the digital equivalent and stop it from being lost forever somehow. 
Um, so um, with dozens of service providers managing content on the site, this was, you know, mistakes like that were bound to happen. Um, and of course, the worst case is like deleting a whole node. And so because Drupal deletes it forever, we switched to using um, Drupal 7 kill file module to solve the nodes. And Drupal 8, we're actually still working on exactly how we want to do that, but it's, yeah, probably with, um, it's a contentious probably with workflows, but like, we're just still working on that. Yep. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> so first thing we learned is that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a large number of residents have no idea what their neighborhood is called. And that might have something to do with having neighborhoods called area. <laughs> and and uh, where's neighborhood nine? Neighborhood nine and, and the, the book port and the, the, like mid Cambridge. That's just amazing. The names that you tag. Uh, and I was living in Cambridge at the time, and I did not know that I was in Wellington like, Harrington until I started working on this project. So, um, but quickly learned that we couldn't just like list the neighborhood names, like filter by neighborhood names. We had to put it on a map so people could have some idea of where they actually live. Um, and the other thing we learned quickly is that out-of-date information about events and programs will drive people away. And so, um, you know, we started showing, um, you know, first of all, like, automatically, like, getting rid of um, old content, and it was actually being, like, removed off of the site, and because search engines are also a very important audience, um, in the next version of the site, we're not ever going to take any content off the site, it's just going to be removed from search, and made very visibly obvious that this is, this is old content. But we want it to be there so that when people use Google to find something, which is about 75% of the traffic coming into the site, and that's actually like most websites, like Google and stuff like that is like 90% of the traffic. Like that 25, 30% of people are coming directly to find a Cambridge and searching for stuff is actually high. So it's somewhat succeeding in things like portal. But still, the majority of people are coming from search traffic. And so we don't want to throw away events to do it. But anyhow. Um, the, we added the report as outdated or inaccurate um, to actually get direct user feedback from, you know, before too many are scared away by something being wrong um, to, to get it right. Um, and uh, again, Cambridge had, had the staff capacity to handle the answers. Um, yeah, and this is just, yeah, yeah little things that, like, we, um, learn um, that, you know, yeah, so we did add the last updated on things. Um, we then, this is an organization page, and we did decide to take them off of organizations as it's not important, as important there. Um, and we're also thinking in the next iteration to not just put the date there, which is confusing. Like, it was important to give people an idea that this is, um, you know, this way this was updated so they know how much to trust the information, um, but we're doing it in different ways now than um, you know, just you know, visually indicate as things get out of date, like I said, um, and not have ever, ever again have collapsed. Um, that, so we apologize for doing that in the first place. We shouldn't need to use the research to tell us that, um, but we got it. Uh, the other thing we learned is that performance is part of the UX. How fast content loads on the site is an important part of the understanding. So this, everyone knows this, but you still like remembering that it's part of UX is important, and like having that like gate and idea factor into what you do is huge. Um, yeah, and that's been um, that's been uh, uh, helpful with with wireframing and um, search behavior, for example, to be in close conversation with Ben and the other developers because. Yeah, there have been a few times when I've suggested things, just the way that data's listed, that I didn't really have like a full understanding of, of like, oh, well, if we're trying to show that data alongside one another in this way, that's a very complicated query. And the, there's you know different ways to display that data in a much more performant way that still meets user needs. Um, yeah, and we've actually talked about this a couple times, and so this is like the like the bold statement of the session, right? Uh, usability testing the usability of content. I I just keep finding that to be the most important thing to do. 
there's just this really important interplay between like what service providers are saying in their programs and events, the whole outdated um, situation, the ages versus the grades being used. Like that, those are all content changes, right? Like, um, and so, uh, I I mean, I I definitely am feeling this from other like agencies out there where like we have more and more. Um, of a sense of ownership over the content of the site, even though we're not subject matter experts, um, because we can just help um, find it, you know, and, and other clients spot those issues, and that's what the you know the ongoing usability research does. Um, and even when we like have the perfect content model, and we're doing everything well, and that even if the process on their end is good. With something that's community driven like this, you have new service providers coming in and out all the time. And so there's times when you have to be like, whoa, 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 this organization doesn't understand how to write for the web. Like, like back up, let's go train them, let's help them out, and then get the content back into a good state on the site. It's just and a constant the next, cycle. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of that is, is, is Cambridge, um, find a Cambridge staff. Yeah. Um, but we help them out a new version of the site with, like, no. This is as many characters as you get. Sorry, like I know you want to keep talking about your program, but people can't process that. Like this is not the place. Build your own website. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hires. Uh, we'll tell you the same thing. But keeping. So this is, I think, the biggest takeaway though is like to try to keep user testing an integral part of the process. So this is a client that was doing it already, mm -hmm. but you still, as the the you know people building the website. And I, for this side, I thought of it as making sure that we would listen to the citizenry more than to the client. Uh, and I said this in front of our client. I said terrible things in front of our clients in the first version of this presentation. I'm much better this time. And they're not here. But they're still working on this, despite my like, saying awful things about them. Um, but you've got, you, have, you can't just keep doing the changes that are asked for from your client or other, you know, you know when anyone who's not actually a user where it hasn't been tested. Yeah. And so, you know, philosophy is listen to meet the people, the stakeholders, keep using the site, learn, and we can keep improving. And yeah, no matter how awesome their clients are, if they want their site to be the best it can be for the people the site is for, you need the end users to always be part of the, um, with the development team, like being able to directly see the results, um, which is fantastic. And I'm gonna burn quickly through some of the you know, more fun mistakes that we saw and corrected. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Being vulnerable. Automatic yeah. translation is the worst. And we know this, but they need it, and they don't have the capacity to translate it. Um, and so this is still something we're trying to figure out in the, in the upgrading 2.0 version of the site. Um, but yeah, this is like translating. <laughs> Massachusetts farmers markets. That's what mass, the mass is for Massachusetts, but they're translated as muscles. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, results relevance is huge, and we'll have screenshots that show that we're still not as good as we want to be on that. Um, I mean, this is actually just an idea, but like people can get to the end stage of no results. We're moving to more facets, so it's harder to do this, but still, like. You know, it's always going to be possible for someone to restrict the results to get to nothing. And like putting a prop there so people can go somewhere from that uh, is going to be important. So yeah, and that's another is just like constant testing, constant like coming through. Like this happens all the time where we get reports back of this this thing showed up when I typed in swimming pool. It has nothing to do with swimming pools. And then we look at the program. It's like. Oh, come to the after school daycare center. It's right next to the swimming pool. Yeah. You know, like, oh, great. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. And, and right now, and it, it, right now, um, uh, Nancy and the uh, the, the, the program, Nancy Calvert and the program director, program manager, are just uh, like editing the content. They're like, that's irrelevant to your program, and just removing the terms that are irrelevant. Like, I, you can fix a lot with content. Um, but you know we still need to do more to weight the, the the categories like vastly higher than any other text, um, which we like we keep cranking it up, and we just have to crank the dial to eleven in the version of the site. Um, so also the other problem they ran into was that no matter what people search for, middle of winter, you know I'm looking for something to do, and they're just like 
water play locations, <laughs> like pools and like waiting spots and like it's just like and just all over because apparently Cambridge has like dozens of them and so they were dominating the results because they had one for each thing and, and so they had also checked every single age like yes everybody yes, exactly. could play in the water <laughs> two year olds 18 year olds yeah, so yeah. Like, and so the first thing we did was just like yeah take that out so like it didn't just show up for like you know anything except the all ages search it doesn't like i'm searching for something for three to five year olds like come to the pool and then we were in the site we're making it places um pulling it out of programs and making concept called place because it's a different thing um, yeah so this is a good and this this again it just goes back to the content again is um and not something we fully anticipated is parks are just this weird thing they're categorized as programs right now they're not events they're not organizations um, and so that's kind of when we had this discussion, we're like, okay, place, like a point of interest is another opportunity that we And then things like that categorize can be cool things like doing season-dependent ranking use, like just yeah. don't like suggest the pools at all yeah. in January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great things about paying close attention to analytics on the community <laughs> event site is that we're, we're, we're checking the analytics and we see this spike and um, in traffic, and we see the, the page that's responsible. This is a city dance party, and I happened to be in town for a design for Drupal when this was happening, and so we were like, what are we gonna do as a team? Let's go to this amazing city dance party, and like Hector from Fine at Cambridge went too, and yeah. so, and so there's two lessons we're benefiting there. from it. One, <laughs> you know, checking your Linux is a key, key tool, um, and just a quick tip on that, Create like your own views, even if it's showing something that that Google can show you, because Google will change how you get to that. You know how you get to filter by what P page people are coming into, or how to filter by audience and all of that stuff. Um, so if you make your own views, you only know know how to get back to see what you want, and don't have to relearn Google Analytics every three months, only every like six or six, six months or so when you actually want to do something new. Um, and the other thing that we learned is that like exposing analytics to the user is can improve the experience. And so something we want to do is like if something is spiking in traffic, like actually show it. Obviously, like you know, this is something like you know, click-driven news sites are already doing, but it's not really built in the civic space. So we'll be doing that. Um. Yep, that's just the description of the party. Yeah, there we are at the party. <laughs> and, then, and the other thing, yeah, nice. and the other thing on that last one was, as I mentioned, like getting rid of the last updated date is key because it's competing with the actual date of the event, and that's something that like direct user research does. Okay. Yeah, just remember, no plane survives contact with the enemy, and Who is the, enemy? the enemy is us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, just that, um, yeah. Know that, you know, you're gonna have to really pay attention to your, your tools and what's gonna happen. And then, um, you know, just your goal in iterative UX is to iterate and change and move up, not to go in a circle. Um, and every once in a while, we have a result that's going in a circle. Um, example from Drupal Core is that it took out, it changed from a checkbox and save in Drupal 8. To having the save and you know, you know, save and publish or save and keep unpublished and all of this stuff as separate buttons, and it was implemented confusingly enough that like they did more user research and reverted it back to just the single checkbox to publish when publish and yeah. save button. So yeah, we um, have a slide we, about that in a little we bit have some too. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, but. And before the site, you know, don't don't make any changes before the site has been used by its intended audience, basically. Uh, that you know, you burn a lot of time um, and uh, yeah. Like do the obvious user testing, but like, you know, don't you don't have to put it live, you can just test with like five people on a site like this can be five people off the street, um, but five people in the intended audience. Yeah. And I think so we at time keep on doing this research. Well this um is pretty, pretty, pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we used a hot jar to kind of figure out 
what people are doing on the site. I kind of want to honestly just like uh, skip to the where we're going with things now because this is a part that I'm pretty interested in and excited about, which is just like combining the approach of open design with continuous um, user research. I mean, if we already have these really great alliances with like Code for Boston and Civic other civic tech groups and find it's amazing about just going out into the field and talking to people, you know, um, and it's an open source project, you know, like building, like designing in a transparent way so that even another designer could come in at some point and contribute. And something I've been thinking about with open source projects is so, so often I don't have like the full background of like what's being accomplished or what's trying to be accomplished and just being told to make things look pretty, right? when really you're trying to solve problems. Um, so we have a public style guide, a public issue queue. We test designs uh, using Figma and with community members. And so you, know, you can go onto the project wiki, see what the brand uh, or the, yeah, the like value proposition is. And the artificially over time, and it turns out the yeah. doors are not locked, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, part swing is great. No, 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 no. Um, Oh yeah, and then one quick thing, we have an iterative UX tag on things. And so even when a user story is complete, um, if we are like have questions about it already and want to just like follow up with testing, we'll have that tag and then we can look at like our closed issue queue and filter by that iterative UX label and be like, oh yeah, we, we rolled that out like a month ago, let's check in on it and see how it's going. Let's scroll, yeah, stop here for the hot oh. drive one second. Um, just heat mapping is a great tool. Um, you know that you can learn things without having to see people in person, and so yeah, we just learned that you know people like just click anywhere to get more information. They wanted to see more programs, so they did it. We're gonna bring the programs onto the site, and people like the other heat map showed was that people would just scroll all the way down to the bottom and click next to just try to find what they're looking for. Uh, so people are like engaged, but we're not quite getting what they need. Yeah, we tested three Sorry. different homepage approaches and got feedback in the issue queue and settled on an approach. This is the new dashboard for now. Um, and this is the new forms for creating a program. And again, like... It's using the new administrative theme that should be going to Drupal 8.9 at some point called Clara. Yeah. And we just sort of added some things on top of it. That was fun. Like, I mean, that, like, getting, like, that whole, like, admin and service provider UX like boost just from getting that fresh theme that was, that's great. Yeah. Um, and then the publish button is confusing. <laughs> that's because of the Drupal course decision. <laughs> we, were, we were just laughing. We just started laughing when they said that and then we had to explain why we were laughing. Uh, but yeah. So and again so much of the feedback is content. Field labels, where fields are grouped. It's again simple for us to implement a huge benefit to the There's user. a lot to chew on when you open your product to iteratively improve the user experience. Just take inspiration from this Cambridge rabbit um, and just pick one strand and start on it. Um, <laughs> next, next. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. And that's Questions? it. And I know we're over time, so thank you, everyone. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's. Uh, we're working with other cities, filling out other find it, so if you think your city could benefit from one, let us know and we can it's talk about it. It's completely open source, so you can you know, give it to another agency that's local, and we just want to like, keep iterating on it and improving the whole platform. Yeah, though? This might be off topic, but either of you catch uh, any shooting stars? Uh, what? Shooting stars. <laughs> Oh, you were staring at the sky for hours. Oh, last night. That's no, right. uh, oh, I did awesome. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's awesome. Oh man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I still have seen like one tree star in my life. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is all the information that's going in there like manually <laughs> put in by the agencies, or is there oh, some sort oh, of man? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh. Um, at least yeah. like yeah. half yeah. of the content yeah. is being fed in directly from the libraries. Okay. okay. Uh, from Minneapolis, we're looking at it from the schools also. Yeah. Cambridge, yeah. the schools yeah. are a disaster. Like the yeah. information is not like online, let alone like in a machine readable format. Okay. But like most of the events that you get in Cambridge are coming from the library, and that's automatic. And we're about to do with MIT and with the city government, although it's going to be the other way around, the city's website is going to pull in the content from Find It. So yeah. Feel like right here, yeah. Yeah. You're now a source of truth. Exactly, exactly.
We fought. We fought our way to that, to the top. So you're setting up APIs. Oh, for so sorry. No worries. No. No. Yeah. Content to go back and forth. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, we're definitely doing the do on to other sites as we wanted them to do on to us. Yeah. Like, because there's so much, like, you know, good content out there that, that can't so be used. Six years in the making of it? It's not any machinery before. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. We're making that's sure like, I mean, like, just like publish perseverance and um, grit. Our sure. sense so, is yeah. mostly what we're going yeah. with because yeah. it's being easier for everyone. But, like, also but, great work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Totally. Like building more yeah. complex APIs, like so they could do the full search. But yeah, yeah. that's on an as needed basis. And your API yeah. work is part of part of what's available. Yeah. In open source. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.